Welcome to the Foresight Health Roundup podcast, Foresight Health's podcast series for healthcare revolutionaries. Outcomes matter, customers count, and value rules. Hello again, everyone. This is Dave Berta, news editor at Foresight Health. It is Thursday, September 5th. I hope everyone had a fun and relaxing Labor Day weekend. That's because everyone who works for someone knows it's going to be pedal to the metal between now and Thanksgiving. Another thing that's going to happen between now and Thanksgiving is our presidential election, set for November 5th. Nothing less than the fate of our democracy is at stake. Vote accordingly. We're going to take a step back from that existential threat and talk about Kamala Harris's health care plan if she's elected president. We're going to talk about it with Dave Johnson, founder and CEO of Foresight Health, and Julie Merchantson, partner at Transformation Capital. Hi, Dave. Hi, Julie. How are you two doing this morning, Dave? Well, I was with a bunch of germ-carrying rugrats over the long weekend. They had just all started school, and their germs sought out Terry and me like heat-seeking missiles, and we now have the head colds and body aches to show for it. <laughs> oh, oh I, remember the, I remember those days. Thanks, Dave. Julie, how are you? Well, I can't believe it's September, and I just took one kid to school, and I'm on the East Coast, and it's a beautiful beautiful stretch of weather. So today's a good day. Yeah, everybody's where they're supposed to be. Now, before we talk about Harris's healthcare plan, let's talk about your Labor Day weekend. Dave, it sounds like you're out of town. I, I was going to ask you if you went to the Wiggums parade. No Wiggums this year, but I love that parade. Everybody marches, nobody watches. The aforementioned Rugrats were our great nieces and nephews in Rhode Island. We had a blast, lots of fun, but we're very happy to be back in sweet home Chicago. Uh, Thank goodness. Thanks, Dave. Julie, how about you? How did you enjoy your Labor Day weekend? Well, if I wasn't flying or packing, I was watching the U.S. Open. So that's pretty much how it went. Ah, ah, tennis, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. How about those American men? How about those American men? Love it. Can't say I watched it. I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> it's okay, Berta. You know, football starts this weekend, so. Oh, <laughs> well, we attended our annual family picnic on my mom's side. It's always a good time. My cousin Russ, who is about my age, uh, we were pretty tight when we were younger, brought an old photo of us together from the late 70s, and there was easily 60 pounds of hair on our heads. <laughs> We were barely recognizable. Pretty crazy. All right, let's talk about whether Harris's plan for healthcare is crazy or sane. I'm going to run down the key healthcare policy components of her plan, and then I'm going to get your reaction. On August 16th, Harris laid out her, quote, agenda to lower costs for American families, close quote. Here are her healthcare actions to do that. One, cap the cost of insulin at $35 per dose for all Americans, not just Medicare beneficiaries. Two, cap the out-of-pocket cost for prescription drugs at $2,000 per year for all Americans, not just Medicare beneficiaries. Three, accelerate Medicare Part D prescription drug negotiations with drug manufacturers, which we talked about in our last podcast. Four, Crack down on anti-competitive behaviors by drug companies that artificially raise drug prices. Five, crack down on abusive business practices by pharmacy benefit managers that artificially raise drug prices. And six, work with states to cancel medical debt for millions of Americans. Those are pretty broad strokes, but they do give you a flavor of what Harris would do. Dave, what do you think of her agenda generally? Is there one action item that stands out to you, good or bad? And what would you whisper in her ear to lower health care costs for all Americans? Well, the agenda, as currently articulated, is a populist one without a lot of specifics. I think that's absolutely brilliant politics. A little bit like Obama in 2008, voters are projecting their views onto Kamala Harris as something of a blank slate. Obama, as I said, used that same approach in 2008. And it's not lost on me that the campaign manager, David Pluff, for Obama in 2008 is now a senior advisor to the Harris campaign. So I think his fingerprints are, are all over this approach. 
And it tells me the Democrats want to win this year. And if 2024 begins to look like 2008, we end up in a movement type election that in 2008 uh, led the Democrats to not only win the presidency, but sweep the House and get a veto proof majority in the Senate. I think it's driving the Republicans nuts. The Trump campaign keeps complaining that they can't pin down candidate Harris on any of her specifics, health care or otherwise. And my guess is they aren't going to between now and Election Day. So I wouldn't take any of this necessarily to the bank. I guess what I would say, Dave, is if I were whispering in her ear, is this is all very complicated and interconnected. And these types of piecemeal actions that she's describing, while politically popular, often have unintended consequences. A dirty secret, for example, of the new Medicare drug pricing for the 10 drugs that was uh, created in the IRA is actually raising Medicare Part D prices pretty dramatically. The Biden administration, under the authority it has from the uh, Affordable Care Act, is testing pricing mechanisms. There's some politics in this. And they're actually using federal dollars to buy down Part D premiums, which will become public in late September, later this month, in the hope of blunting the negative message uh, drug pricing that will come out from that. And I think the lesson here is that, one, it's complicated. The economy is very complicated. The healthcare economy is very complicated. Price controls don't work. Just ask Nixon. If I were whispering into a President Harris's ear post-election about healthcare reform, I would stress the need for systemic reform to address systemic failures in healthcare prices. I wouldn't put too much into any of these proposals except that they're good politics. And if the Harris administration, should it come into being, is very serious about health care reform, they're going to need to approach it in a deep systemic way, hopefully by bipartisan way, to really get at some of the underlying systemic failures built into the system as it currently operates. Yeah. Go big or go home. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Julie, any questions for Dave? Let's say that the Harris Waltz campaign actually takes a serious approach to canceling medical debt or capping drug costs at two thousand dollars for everyone. Can they do that in a way that affects positive long-term change without driving up federal and state debt in a material way or you know significantly harming big pharma? Is there some sort of creative policy or regulatory path that aligns everybody? It's such a great question. I think there is a regulatory and policy path that's good for the country, good for consumers, but it means attacking these very embedded fiefdoms of privilege that have very powerful constituencies behind them that will fight with every fiber of their being progressive reform that really puts forward level field competition, pricing transparency, and so on. And at the end of the day, uh, since we're all believers that uh, high functioning markets are the way to improve healthcare. We really can't get that done without pricing transparency, level field competition, regulations that protect consumers uh, and protect the marketplace. So that's not easy to accomplish, but I think we've tried every other alternative, Julie. Now it's hard. Now it's time to dig in and do the hard work of, of real regulatory and legislative reform that improves market behaviors. I'm here for it, Dave. Thanks. Julie, same three questions. What do you think of Harris's agenda generally? Is there one action item that stands out to you, good or bad? And what would you whisper in her ear to lower health care costs for all Americans? You know, generally, there's a few components that sound great to the average consumer. So I agree politically, like this is great, like the $2,000 drug cap for everyone and canceling medical debt that we just talked about. But they seem very difficult to execute, even with the most aggressive anti-corporate stance. And I don't really know that there's a lot to be done in those two. And there are a few components that are quite rational extensions of what's already underway, like the Medicare price negotiations. And you can get a lot of press out of those for the dollars saved per beneficiary without seeming to do too much industry damage. So I guess I'd say that in an election year when healthcare is not the number one issue, you know, there's not a lot of risk here for 
going out on the limb to say something that's super different that's going to get them in trouble. It seems like a pretty safe platform. The one thing, of course, I love, and this will sound like a broken record with Dave, but um, I like the transparency push and cracking down on the abusive middlemen in the pharmaceutical industry. We have much better ways to operate than where we've gotten with traditional PBMs. And I think it's good that she wants to push there. It was good politically and in, you know, in the truest actions, it could actually be quite productive for the industry. That to me seems like one where there could actually Dave be some systemic mm, yeah. action as opposed to everything else on this list. What would I whisper in her ear? <laughs> well, it's a few things, of course, Berta, sorry. My first would be transparency, transparency, transparency. And the more she can push for transparency as a bargaining chip, as a, you know, a guideline, as a, a way of creating change, the better. And that, of course, includes the second, which is data, data, data. CMS has come a long way in the last 10 to 15 years of collecting its own data and analyzing its data. So let's use that data and be smart about how do we accelerate Medicare negotiations. And, you know, that there's there's so much more they could do with their power to actually pull together market data that they haven't even done to combine with their data. So that's number two. Number three and last is, this is a different way of saying what Dave said, but I would dig deep into how to deliver healthcare for consumers and health for consumers for the long term. I mean, ask yourself what the industry should look like to serve consumers well into the future because the short-term consumer wins that are often considered wins in healthcare today politically are not always creating long-term value at all. Yeah, you gave her an earful. That's great. Thanks, Julie. Dave, any questions for Julie? Along with President Biden, the Harris-Waltz team was making a strong pitch for labor support over the long Labor Day weekend. What I'm wondering, given the strong support for labor unions, is how will a Harris administration handle the thorny issue of mandated staffing ratios that the major nurses unions across the nations advocate? Do you have a take on that? You know, the strong pitch for labor support message is will create a higher cost system, right? But the mandated staffing ratios seems to me to be quite in line with that. Am I missing your point? Well, what I'm thinking is when you mandate staffing ratios, you're mandating continuation of sort of a high cost centralized delivery system and you prevent technology innovation from coming in. And yes doing the same jobs better for less cost, both in terms of labor and materials. Yeah, I think you're right, because the first thing I said was it's just going to increase the cost of the system. You know, you have to kind of put it all together with how they might be looking at, you know, in other areas of their platform as it's coming together, you can see threads of innovation and threads of even funding innovative businesses in other areas. So it's a little lopsided when you think about the, the labor support message and what you're seeing in other areas of the platform. Well, you are seeing a backlash by organized nurses, unionized nurses against AI technology. Oh, I'm sure. All right. That's happening in California. So, uh, Although ironically, in, the yeah. physicians are starting to really see the value of the co-pilot. So... <laughs> <laughs> right. You know. And the nurses think they're going to be replaced by that. So, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting dynamic happening. But thanks, Julie. I've got a thing about canceling medical debt, which is one of her planks. You know, I think it's great for consumers if you have, you know, unpaid medical bills and somebody's going to take that off your plate. But it does nothing to incentivize providers to make care more affordable. And I think it does just the opposite. You know, if you know someone ultimately is going to pay the bill, why not raise prices as high as you can? All right. And I'm not an economist. <laughs> I've never even taken an economics class. But you play one on TV, <laughs> on a podcast. That's exa exactly. Thanks, David. Thanks, Julie. And now let's talk about other big healthcare news that happened this past week. It wasn't all bad, was it? Julie, what else happened that we should know about? Well, I saw a little tidbit. I'm sure this happens all the time and never quite makes a headline, but that the House Oversight Committee has accused leaders of the three largest PBMs, speaking of our topic today, 
of lying during a July congressional hearing. Uh oh. So <laughs> looks like Patrick Conway from Optum, Adam Kotzner from Express Scripts, and David Joyner from Caremark are being accused of lying and they have to actually restate their testimony by September 11th or fines or jail time comes their way, which I thought was quite something. Wow. <laughs> Haven't they ever heard of fact checking? Right. <laughs> Unbelievable. Now that you're assuming they're guilty. <laughs> Let's see. We shall see. Dave, what other news is worth mentioning? You know, Dave, I've got a little bit of, uh, I guess, be in my bonnet to use an old phrase about yeah. medical debt payment as well. I was digging into a company called Undo Medical Debt, which used to be called Rest in Peace Medical mm -hmm. Debt, and they claim to have bought down something like $13 billion in outstanding medical debt. And when you actually dig into what they do, they are essentially paying health systems, hospitals, basically $10 for every $1,000 of medical debt relief. But the reason they're able to pay just 1% for this is these are bills that the medical systems, health systems, have already decided they can't collect and therefore are going to be uncollectible and written off. And so in some ways, this is a boon to the, to the health systems. They get a financial payment for medical debt that they were going to write off. It really does nothing for consumers at all because their debt is already forgiven. They do get a nice letter in the mail. Maybe that has some psychological benefit. And, you know, if private philanthropists get sold a bill of goods and like Melinda Gates and want to fund this kind of thing, you know, more power to them. What bothers me is the Biden administration approved the use of American rescue monies to fund these types of buyback programs. And so the city of Chicago, the city of Toledo, I think Los Angeles, others are using federal dollars essentially to buy back medical debt under the guise that it's going to provide financial relief to consumers. But all it's really doing is just creating a mechanism that pays hospitals a little money for wiping debt off their books that they were already going to put into the uncollectible account. Well, Dave, you always said the smartest people in healthcare work in revenue cycle. <laughs> yes. I, yeah, they figure it out. Kind of proves your point. <laughs> well done. Thank you. And thank you, Julie. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics we discussed on today's show, please visit our website at foresighthealth.com. You also can subscribe to The Roundup on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Don't miss another segment of the best 20 minutes in healthcare. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Burdup for Foresight Health.